So let's create this welding effect. And what I'm really after here is this look of sort of stack coins around a welding seam that is often associated with really good welds. So inside Houdini, let's drop down a geo node, dive inside, and let's create a demo objects that we want to weld together. So in this case, let's drop down a tube and let's give it a radius of 0.2. Let's leave the height at 1. Let's set the primitive type to polygon and let's give it some fairly high resolution with around 64 columns and 32 rows. Let's duplicate our tube and drop down a transform node. Go to our first tube and set the display flag at our transform and let's simply move a second tube in the position that we want. Something like this. Drop down a merge, wire both in, and this is our base geo that we will build a weld with. Let's drop down a null as an input, and let's work on our effect. And the first thing that I want to do is to find the intersection seam of both our objects. And this is done quite easily with a boolean node. Drop one down, wire it in, and set the operation to seam. And as you can see here, we now have the seam of intersection of both our objects, and with this a guide for our welding. Now if I turn on the point display, we can see that this is quite irregular, which is not what we want for a clean weld. So let's fix this, and the simplest way to do this is with a resample node. Let's drop one down, wire it in, and set the length to 0 0.02, which looks fine. Now one thing that the reassemble node does is it creates an open curve. So if I turn on point numbers and find our first point, we can see here that both our point zero and our last point, our point 90, are directly on top of each other, which is not what we want. So let's fix this quickly with a fuse node. And if I wire it in and highlight this, we can see now that both our points are merged into a single point. Let's zoom back out and let's work on our weld bead a bit. So drop down another tube. And in this case, I want a radius of 0 0.015 and also a height of 0 0.015. Set the display flag and zoom in a bit. And in this case, let's also set the primitive type to polygon and let's give it 32 divisions and also turn on end caps. Now what I want to do is to give this a bit of a bend. So to do this, let's drop down a edit sub, wire it in, highlight it, and let's select our selection tool, set it to edges, and let's zoom out a bit because I want to select the edges along our Z axis, which are this one and this one, and I want to move them down. So let's go to a move tool, move them down, and adjust the soft fall off so that we get a shape like this. Now let's quickly clean our mesh a bit by dropping down a divide node. And now we have the basic shape of one of our weld beads. So now that we have both our weld curve and our weld bead, we can start copying our weld beads around. So let's drop down a copy to points and wire both our weld beads and our weld seam in and zoom out again so we can see our entire object. And what we can see here is that it's sort of working, but we really need to fix the orientation of our weld beads. So how can we orient our weld beads on our weld curve? If you used the copy to points node before, then you probably know that we can use the normal vector of a target point to control the orientation of our copy. But the problem here is that this really only controls the orientation around this single axis. And our copy can still rotate in unexpected ways around this axis, which we don't want in case of our weld beads. So how can we lock down our copy in all three axes? We can use another attribute for this, and this is called orient inside Houdini. And the orient attribute is something called a quaternion. Now, there is a lot of things that we can say and teach about quaternions, but what we really only need to know for this effect is what it exactly does and how we can create it. So what a quaternion does is it's a really efficient way to describe an orientation in 3D space. So in this case, this is our way to really lock down the orientation of our copy on our curve. And what we need to create one is, again, in this case, a group of three vectors. And these three vectors sort of describe a coordinate system. We have an X vector, a Y vector, and a C vector, and they are all perfectly perpendicular to each other. So if we can construct all these three vectors, we can then create our orient attribute and with this really lock down the orientation of our copy on our curve. So how do we construct these three vectors? What we need to do first is find 
two vectors on our curve. And both vectors should be sort of perpendicular to another, but they don't need to be exact in this case. So the ones that I'm going to use here are both the normal vector and the tangent vector. And what we should do next is decide which vector of these will be part of our final coordinate system. And in this case, I chose the tangent vector and called it z in this case. So this will be our z axis. Now, all we need to do now to create our other vectors is to use a double cross product. So what's this? A cross product is a function and what it takes as arguments are two vectors. In this case, our tangent z vector and our temp vector. And what it will give us in return is a vector that's perfectly perpendicular to both of these. And in this case, this will be our x vector. And what we can do now is we can ignore our normal vector and take our z and x vector and use a cross product again, which will give us a vector that's again perpendicular to both. And this will be our y vector. So as a result, we have our x, y, and z vector and all are perfectly perpendicular to each other and are therefore something we can create our quaternion and orient attribute with. So let's do this. Let's jump back into our scene and let's first get our tension vector because this is really quite easy to get. Let's go to our resample node and let's check the tension attribute down here. And if we check the info of our node, we can see that we have a new attribute called tangent u. And if we create a visualizer and set its type to marker and its style to vector, we can see that this is our tension vector for our curve. So now let's get the normal vector. And if I turn on normal display, we can see that unfortunately the Boolean node won't give us a normal vector if we set its mode to Z. So let's construct our own normal vector. Let's use a, another Boolean, set its mode to union, and let's create point normals on our new geo. So let's drop down a normal node, add normals to points, and let's transfer these normals back onto our seam using an attribute transfer. So uncheck primitives and on points, let's select the normals and we can turn off the distance threshold and I want to turn off the max sample count. So if you turn on our point normals now, we can see that these are looking really fine. Well, they are a bit jagged, so let's quickly smooth them out as well. So let's use an attribute blur. And on this, let's set the attribute to normal. And we have to uncheck pin border points down here to make it work. And if we now turn up the blurring iterations, we can see that this is working quite well for us. So we have both our vectors and now let's use them to create our int attribute. So let's drop down a point rank and wire it below our attribute blur and hit Alt E inside the editor window to make it large. And now let's write our expression. Let's get our first vector. In this case, I'm starting with tangent u. And this will be our c vector inside our final orient attribute. So let's call it c. And just to be safe here, I want to also normalize RC vector, so it has a length of exactly one. Let's do the same for our temp vector, which will be our normal vector, vector TMP. And let's again normalize it and select our normals. Now let's do our double cross product. So let's create our first new vector, and this will be our X vector, and it's the cross product of our C vector and our TMP vector. Now the order of the vectors inside the parentheses is important. So in your setup, if your orientation is somehow flipped the wrong way, you might want to flip the order of the vectors inside here as well. And we don't need to normalize a vector this time because a cross product of two normalized vectors will also automatically yield another normalized vector. Let's create our last vector. So vector y equals the cross of our vector x and our vector z. Now we have all three of our vectors and we can create our orient attribute. Well, not quite. Unfortunately, in Vex, there is no function where we can create a quaternion directly from these three axes. And we have to go a little detour over a rotation matrix. But again, this is really not that complicated. We first have to create our matrix. And in this case, we want a matrix three. Let's call it rod. And we really don't need to know what exactly this says in this case. We just need to know the right function. And in this case, this is the make transform. And we can give this two of our vectors. In this case, it wants the C and the Y vector. And what this will create is essentially a matrix that also describes a orientation in 3D space, but not quite as efficient as a quaternion. So this is why Houdini internally uses quaternions for orientation and not a matrix. But again, these two things really kind of mean the same thing. 
And now let's use a matrix to create our quaternion. And I want to write this directly to an attribute. So let's first create our attribute, which in this case is p at orient. And to create it, we use the quaternion function and just give this a rotation matrix so this gets converted to a quaternion. Let's apply and accept this. And if we take our angle now and wire this into our copy to points and highlight it, and maybe turn off the normal display, we can now see that this is working fine. Now what we can actually do to make it a little more realistic is to tilt our weld beads a little bit. So below our divide node, let's drop down a transform node and give it an X rotation of say 15 degrees. And this is really getting close to our weld beads look that we are after. Let's preview this with our input geo. So zoom out a bit, let's drop down a merge and let's wire in both our copy to points and our geo in null. And what we can see is, yes, this is sort of working, but it's stuck a bit too far inside our base geo. So we have to push it out a bit. And there's a really quick way to do this. And this is with a peak sub. And what this does is it just will move points along their normal. So let's do this and slowly move them out. And what we can see here is this is sort of working. We get a nice result up here, but as we can see, we're really moving those weld bits too far out on this shallow section compared to this really narrow section of a weld up here. So we somehow have to move out our points depending on the curvature on a base object. So let's try to build our own peaks up that can take this curvature into account. Delete our own peaks up again and let's first measure the curvature of our base object. So let's move up to our normal sub right here and let's drop down a measure sub. And in there, we want to measure not the area, but the curvature. And we want to change the element type to points so that we have our curvature attribute on the points. Let's verify this. Let's jump to our geo spreadsheet. And there is our curvature on our points. Now let's copy it onto our seam. So let's jump to our attribute transfer to the attributes tab and let's add our curvature attribute in here as well. And in my case, the curvature attribute also needed a bit of blurring. So let's also add it to our attribute blur node like this. And now let's drop down a point drop to build our smarter peak node right below our point wrangle, highlight it and jump inside. Now what I want to do here is first of all import our attribute. So let's drop down a bind, change the name to curvature and leave the type at float. And the first thing that I want to do is to convert this into a zero to one range. So you can do this with a fit range sub. And we can leave the destination min and destination max at zero and one. And let's promote the source min and source max so we can change the input size outside. Let's jump outside, scroll down on our paint warp and let's jump into the geo spreadsheet and let's grab the smallest value of our curvature and paste it in and also the largest value of our curvature and paste this in as well. Jump back inside and let's actually start moving our points. So we can use a displays along normal node for this. And this needs our current point position as well as our normal and also the amount that we want to move it, which in this case is the output of our fit node. So wire all these three inputs in and let's export our new position. And as we can see here, this is already sort of working, but it's really a bit too large. So let's fix this first. Let's drop down another fit for this. And in this case, I want to leave the source min and source max both at zero and one and control the destination min and destination max. So let's promote both of these, jump back out and let's for now just make them a bit smaller, something like this. Now, the last thing that I want to add this to give it a little bit more control is a ramp parameter. Let's make some space, drop down a ramp parameter, set the ramp time to spline ramp and wire it in between both our fits. Now let's jump back out again. And for now, let's just fix the ramp. And now let's tweak our values. Let's highlight our last merge again, zoom in a bit, and let's first tweak the minimum. So these are just moved out the right amount. Let's do the same for the maximum like this. And let's now tweak the ramp to tweak all values in between, something like this. Now we're almost done. 
the last thing that I want to do is to work on the look of our belt beads. And what I basically want to do is to VDB merge them together. So let's drop down a VDB from polygons while below our copy to points. And the voxel size is way too coarse. So let's put it to 0.001. This looks a lot better. Let's move it out with a VDB smooth SCF and tweak the iterations a bit. Let's say around six. And let's drop down a convert VDB to convert it back to a mesh. So let's set it smooth to polygons and let's maybe tweak the adaptivity to tweak the poly count of our web beads, something like this. Now let's wire this into our merge, highlight it, and maybe set our display to smooth shaded so we can better see our result. And this looks like a well beat. There's one last thing that we can do, and this is to add a bit of randomness to make our well beats look a bit more natural. And this is really simply done with a point jitter. So let's search for point jitter and wire it in between our point fob and our copy to points. And really, really, really scale down the scale to something like 0, 0, 2. And what this does is just add a little bit of randomness to the position of each point, which will give our world a somewhat more natural look. So this is it, and thanks, and bye-bye.